Welcome to the Personnel File, where we look into the career and personality of Star Trek's characters. Today we're addressing the record of Captain James T. Kirk, so as usual with the Personnel File, I will be using Alpha Continuity Canon to list out the career, and where there are blanks, filling in the missing time with beta content as long as it doesn't conflict with the existing lore. James Jim Tiberius Kirk was born in 2233, March 22nd in Riverside, Iowa, Earth, and was named off. That information is not on file. file. James Jim Tiberius Kirk was born in 2233, January the 4th, aboard a medical shuttle fleeing the USS Kelvin NCC-0514. His parents were George and Winoa Kirk. George Kirk died protecting and evacuating the USS Kelvin, saving around 800 lives. Winoa moved back to Earth, where she remarried and settled in Riverside, Iowa, around 2240. The young Kirk never got along with his stepfather and often acted out against his authority, especially when his mother wasn't present. Growing up, he stole his father's, George's, Chevy Corvette and took it out for a joyride, driving it into a quarry while being pursued by local police. During this time, Kirk partook in numerous academic aptitude tests, and it was revealed that he possessed a near-genius intellect, if a complete lack of discipline. In 2255, at the age of 22, Kirk reached the Riverside Shipyard, a local frequented by Starfleet officers. Amid a bar brawl, Captain Christopher Pike walks in and takes the young Kirk aside. Familiar with his father, George Kirk's acts, he offers James Kirk a sponsorship to enter Starfleet Academy and give his life a focus, daring Kirk to outperform his father's legacy. After pondering the idea, he eventually caught the shuttle to Starfleet Academy, where he met Leonard McCoy. He joined the command training program with the goal of becoming a ship's captain. He also studied advanced tactical training and was assigned captain to the Cadet Team Delta for training scenarios. In 2256, he was assigned field learning on the USS Farragut, where he was awarded the Palm Leaf of Axe in Our Peace mission for Valor by Captain Garovic. At Starfleet Academy in 2258, he took the Kobayashi Maru test twice, and failed both times, as expected. On his third attempt, however, he cheated, by rewriting the program in advance, and was placed on academic suspension. It was here that he was confronted by the instructor, Commander Spock, who had been overseeing the test scenario, but an official verdict on Kirk's actions was never reached, as a distress call from Vulcan called away the newly completed USS Enterprise NCC-1701. Its crew was drafted from the numerous available officers, most of who were cadets. Cadet Kirk was not selected as a crew member for the ship, and it fell to Dr. Leonard McCoy to take Kirk aboard as a patient of his. During the confrontation with Nero, Captain Pike promoted Kirk to acting first officer and assigns him the rank of lieutenant. Commander Spock found Kirk's attitude irreconcilable with Spock's command style and had him marooned just outside Starfleet's Delta Vega base. It was here that he encountered Spock from the unaltered future, who, being the best friend of Prime Kirk, convinces the younger Kirk of his duty and gives him insight into the younger Spock's mental state. From here, he met Montgomery Scott and returned to the Enterprise where, acting as First Officer, accused Spock of being emotionally unbalanced due to Vulcan's loss and asked him to step down. Spock acquiesced and the USS Enterprise fell to the command of acting Captain James Kirk. Later that year, Kirk was officially made captain of the Enterprise and assigned his own crew, based mostly on the candidates selected by Captain Pike before him. In 2259, Kirk contained an outbreak of Tribbles aboard the Enterprise. He also made contact with the people of Gamma Trianguli 6, a race of reptilian aliens called the Gorn, attempted to enter the galaxy through a Vulcan-made portal, but were thwarted by the crew of the Enterprise. It's unknown if these Gorn were related in some way to those native to the Milky Way galaxy, but they possessed a number of distinct differences. Captain Kirk was assigned a survey to Phidias IV, where he encountered a former Starfleet captain, Robert April. 
In 2259, Kirk was demoted to commander for violating the Prime Directive on Nibiru and assigned as First Officer to Captain Pike. The Enterprise crew became entangled in a scheme from Admiral Marcus in Section 31 to incite a new war with the Klingon Empire, and encountered an altered Khan Noonien Singh who had been brought into Section 31 as a military advisor and designer. Kirk was reinstated as captain in rank and position of the USS Enterprise by Admiral Marcus who wished Kirk to pursue and terminate Khan. Not long after, the struggles resulted in Kirk receiving a fatal dose of radiation from the malfunctioning warp core of the Enterprise. He died inside the chamber. Fortunately, Chief Medical Officer McCoy devised a cleansing serum from Khan's blood to rapidly heal Kirk's damaged tissue, and after extensive care, Kirk was revived. The Enterprise was then grounded for almost a year for minor refits and repair. In 2260, Starfleet reinstated its plans for deep space exploration that the Constitution class had originally been intended for, and assigned Captain Kirk and the USS Enterprise to the first wave of these five-year missions to seek out new life and new civilizations. In 2261, Q entertained himself by exploring different realities and arrived aboard the USS Enterprise, toying with the crew and wishing to see the future of the Kelvin universe, teleported them to the year 2369, Terak-Nor. In 2263, Kirk was negotiating a peace between the Fibon Fibonan, Fibon Fibonan Republic and the Tanaxi delegation. Not long after, the USS Enterprise NCC-1701 was ambushed over Ultimid and brought down by Kroll's swarm ships. Kirk assumed temporary command of the USS Franklin NX-326 to save the Federation station Yorktown. Kirk was reassigned to the USS Endeavour NCC-1805, replacing Captain Derbez. In early 2263, an unknown craft had arrived at the edges of Federation space after destroying the USS Concorde NCC-6871. This ship turned out to be a single Borg sphere, responding to the presence of the Narada detected years earlier, which itself contained Borg technology. During this year, Cadet Jayla is brought aboard for training. Also, briefly Kirk was impersonated by the mad Garth of Izar. Later in 2263, the Babel Conference is held with the Romulans and Federation to discuss a potential Borg threat. By the end of the year, Starfleet has completed construction of a Constitution refit design and assigned it the name USS Enterprise, NCC-1701A, in honour of Kirk's previous command. The last recorded events in the Kelvin timeline had Kirk and the crew engaged in a merger of realities where various incarnations of the Trek universe were colliding in detrimental fashion. This quantum storm was being generated by the being evolved from Esper Gary Mitchell. It's hard to talk about the Kelvin iteration of James Kirk without comparing him to his counterpart, as there are a number of differences caused by drastically different upbringings. James Kirk was a very rash youth, he displayed frequent anti-authoritative behaviours, and this came out as a lack of respect for his parental figures and left him feeling aimless by the time he had progressed through his teenage years. It must have been hard for him, forever being known as the kid whose dad saved lives, and a sense of expectation was likely levelled against him. He had the ability to excel at academia, as indicated by his scores from aptitude tests, but chose not to apply himself perhaps conscious of the idea that he would never match up to his father. Pike eventually goads the young Kirk into joining Starfleet by way of a dare, to at least get him to consider the idea. The fact that this works relies on Kirk's superficial tendencies to rebel, but cuts much deeper and appeals to a sense of direction he desperately needed. The dare got him to accept Starfleet, his inner drive got him to stay. That's not to say he was a model student. Unlike his prime counterpart, this Kirk's rebelliousness was much closer to the surface and he acted on instinct and spur-of-the-moment decisions, effectively relying on a mix of innate tactical ability, charm and seeming luck to wing it through scenarios. Throughout his academy days, he used his bad boy reputation to try to win over many a girl's affection, sometimes more successfully than others. But this attitude was later dropped as he got older, though again, unlike his prime version, these elements of him sat much closer to his emotional surface. 
His proclivity towards tactics and natural charm are qualities that are often signifiers of a good starship captain, and he had no trouble rallying his friends, and later crew, to action, and kept a level head in most confrontations. It took him much longer, however, to learn the lessons of diplomacy, and apply that tactical brilliance to find less confrontational means of settling disputes. From an early age, we can see he had been conditioned to fight or flight a problem in a direct manner, and perhaps he even enjoyed the adrenaline rush it brought him. The one thing that he learns in the Academy, it seems, however, is that when other people's lives are in his hands, that gung-ho attitude won't fly. It's hard to justify his rapid rise to Captain of the Enterprise as anything other than the film trying to place Kirk in the chair before the film's climax, and the fact he went from cadet to captain in rank in a year is ludicrous, but this is then tied into concerns regarding the second film where Pike openly admits that he may have promoted Kirk too quickly, and reins him in, assigning him as his executive officer. In this fashion, he can continue to monitor and instruct Kirk in proper leadership. His disregard for the Prime Directive in this situation shows a lot of arrogance, but also a clear morality developing. To him, saving lives is far more important than exposing a primitive culture to alien life. Correct or not, this combined with his prior attitude of bending the rules paints him in a very impulsive light. For this reason, more than ever before, this Kirk needs his companions to counter his emotions. He needs McCoy to point out the cynical but often realistic consequences of his actions, while Spock had to bring him the raw, unbiased facts to placate his impulsive acts. By the time he's progressed three years into the Enterprise's first five-year mission, he has very much matured as a person. He's finally grown to fit the power and status he was granted early on in his life learned through trial, error, and the realisation that he needs others, that the bending of rules is sometimes necessary, but it shouldn't be your go-to solution for problem solving. Though he does, and will always, have those rebellious tendencies, smirking at reminders of his younger days. This does show a slight conflict with his own inherent nature, and by the beginning of Star Trek Beyond, he is considering taking a desk job, thinking that any change would be better, and growing concerned with his ability to lead. When his worst fears come true and he loses his ship, he finds that that doesn't necessarily mean he will lose his friends, and his commitment to protecting and exploring is reaffirmed. As far as hobbies go, this Kirk had an appreciation for Earth's history, especially American history, but rather than focusing on earlier periods, it seems he gravitated towards more 20th to 21st century oddities. Originally, his father, George Kirk's hobby of collecting, or maybe restoring, classic vehicles was adopted by a young Kirk, maybe in a way for him to try to understand his father. He was described by those under him as a fearless and relentless captain who wouldn't ask anything of the crew he wouldn't do himself. This statement is a testament to his persona and inspiring nature, as well as perhaps a nod to the fact that he was still rather quick to assign himself to a hazardous job. And of all the people who said this about him, it was Lieutenant Hendorf, that burly security officer who started a fight with Kirk in the Riverside Shipyard's bar, and survived all three films wearing a red shirt. This isn't the Kirk from the original series. This is a Kirk who never had the guidance he needed to set out for the captain's chair from a young age, but did possess the raw potential to form a captain as iconic, if only he could be shaped somewhat. In an urgency to bring responsibility and promote growth, he was placed in a command position too early and had a trial by fire that eventually began to create the more capable leader Pike saw he could be, and the universe, any Trek universe, needed him to. Without this lenient support, it's unlikely he would have developed beyond the cocky, aimless rogue he began as. Thanks for listening to this personnel file of the alternate reality version of James Tiberius Kirk. Usually at this stage I'd recommend a couple of episodes to focus on, but there's really no point here. Instead, I'd suggest maybe picking up some of the graphic novels around the Kelvin universe if you see them for cheap, as for the foreseeable future, that's the only further tales we're going to get of the alternate Kirk and the Kelvin universe. Thanks again for watching, and until next video, I'll see you later. Goodbye.